Great. Hi, I'm Mike Zaida. And uh, today's presentation for the IEEE Computer Games column is why did I say yes to writing this bi-monthly column? And I'll start out by sharing you the slides and we'll work our way through them. Is it there? With my small picture of me up in the upper corner. All right. So just to show you, it's actually in print already. There's the cover and away we go. Michael, is that a biography? You don't, I'll just put this up there for a second. Um, biography, I served on a National Research Council committee that put out a report called Virtual Reality, Scientific and Technological Challenges. I chaired a committee that put out a report called Modeling and Simulation, Linking Entertainment and Defense for the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board of the National Research Council. I directed the development of the America's Army game. I received a IEEE uh, Virtual Reality Technical Achievement Award in 2017. I co-wrote a book with Sandeep Singhal, Network Virtual Environments. I am an IEEE fellow. I am an ACM fellow. I was a senior editor for the MIT Press Journal Presence for 12 years. Uh, wrote the operating plan of research agenda that founded the Institute for Creative Technologies. And uh, I founded the ACM SIGGRAPH Symposium on Interactive 3D Graphics and Games. I am an advisor to the Ministry of Culture in Shanxi Province, China. I founded the MOVES Institute at the Naval Postgraduate School, the Modeling Virtual Environments and Simulation Institute. And I chaired the committee that put out a report called Design in the New Millennium, How NASA Should Design Space Systems in the Future. Anyway. Oh, yes, um, senior member of the National Academy of Inventors and a fellow of the Asia Pacific Artificial Intelligence Association. So let's move on. Um, startups, I'm advisor to a whole host of startups. So I'm not just a professor, I also advise startups. One of Thanos, which has invented a way to do virtual reality without a head mounted display. Mo A, which is in Shenzhen in China, <clears throat> which has built AI tools for games for education and is building a whole list of stores where you can take your child and learn which educational games you should get for your child. Concurrence is a very cool architecture for streaming slices of games for esports and other advertisement and purposes. Uh, I am advisor to the Eon Foundation, which is in Beijing, Palo Alto and Singapore. It's a cryptocurrency for digital games equally PBC, which is Games for Education. I was advisor to Mira Labs in its startup, which is an AR B2B developer, Mobile Technologies in Oakland, California, which is AI powered social media tools, Red Pill VR, which is a live DJ experience in virtual reality, versus game, which is a predictive betting game, doing amazingly well, funded by some awesome people. Primal Space Systems, Star Coach in Beijing, which has learned to speak English by playing characters. And Rosario, which is in Venice, which is AI with EQ. So welcome to the games column. The games column is a bi-monthly column about topics I'm thinking about in games, in the games industry. Now I'm primarily a tech person. I kind of like the new electronics, the new software, the new ideas that get us technology for games of the future. And so this column is going to be about that. We're gonna try and get it written every other month to meet the publishing schedule of IEEE Computer Magazine. I have a couple of ideas that I plan for this column and this first column will be to let you know what I'm thinking about with respect to this game technology future. If you have anything to say about these issues or topics I'm planning on covering, send me an email or come up on the Facebook group that I created for uh, IEEE Computer Games column and argue with me or come up on LinkedIn. It's okay to tell me, here's something you don't know about because the world is big. The game industry is huge and all the tech ideas people are thinking about in their basements and in their labs are perhaps secret, but perhaps they want to give us a hint at what the future is. Let's start out and talk about some of the topics I'm thinking about for future columns. I think the first topic that comes to my mind is where does R&D for the games industry happen? And in the games industry, Game studios do the big D for development, but they do not do much in the way of R, so it's really a small R. Research tends to come out of what's done inside of universities. 
And what's done inside of universities is stovepiped, and those stovepipe walls are guarded like Fort Knox, meaning that individual departments, for the most part, stick to what they know and rarely step into the realm of class disciplinary. Once you get past all those walls, what does get built in a university is a prototype. Usually a prototype without an attached business plan or plan for scaling, hopefully with a filed or issued patent. It is something that is far from being a delivered technology, let alone something to be deployed in a commercial game. We kind of need a middle ground type of organization or laboratory where those ideas can be built out in a more advanced prototype. We need a laboratory that knows how to build games that can take these new developed technologies and put them into play in an online game. What I have in mind is something kind of like Google Research Kernel for the games technology industry. For perhaps older generation, you might say, we want something like the Bell Labs for the games industry. There are not any labs focused on the totality of future of technology for games, meaning building out games to test, try out new technologies. There ought to be a university that has a big program for this, that has donations from every major game company in the world to build and test out the research for the future of games. Right now, there is not. Right now, our research model in the United States is distributed and it tends to be small projects. So the way I always think about this is the computer science field itself was originally founded on a lot of DARPA money. And DARPA would say, we wanna know something about distributed computing. And they would give 5 million a year to several universities and say, just go do some research in this area, graduate some PhDs, tell us what the topics and solutions are for distributed computing. That proposal would be about one page long. And, but in 1994, Congress passed legislation that changed DARPA so that they had to build stuff that would have direct impact for the warfighter. The consequence of this is that most of the basic research in computing stopped getting funded in favor of very short-term developments that could be examined every 90 days and shipped to the warfighter in the field. If we look at the list of interesting research areas that DARPA funded that have had longevity like the internet or VLSI design, all those types of grand things are no longer being funded because DARPA basically funds defense contractors to build small pieces of software based on already existing work and they want some twists and changes on it, but there's no big new area in the R&D column. So anyway, my thought is that universities ought to have a games research institute somewhere with its focus not just on design, but on technologies that could change the way we do game design and development. So in the future game columns, we'll talk more about this, but this is one area that I think a whole lot about. Another area that I very much love is what I would call, will I see biometric sensor-based gaming happen anytime before I die? And that might be the title I use, and it would be really nice if I could. Uh, I was an advisor for a brain sensor company, MSense, for seven years, and the goal was, let's make a sensor, a hybrid EEG device that can basically measure what the physical and emotional state of the human is so that we could then build games that take the, that information, put it into an AI character that understands and has a good model of emotions and a physical model of what the AI character can do, and then come back and interact with the human in a way such that the game can make the human cry. This is reference to the ad campaign Electronic Arts used in their early years, about 1982. The idea being we'd like to have games that are like film. And in fact, this is a, a, a badly scanned version of their uh, original ad. It was entitled, Can a Computer Make You Cry? And, uh, you know, it's We See Further, Farther, Electronic Arts. I will just, uh, I could read you this. It's kind of cool. Right now, no one knows. This is partly because many would consider the very idea frivolous. But it's also because whoever successfully answers this question must first have answered several others. Why do we cry? Why do we laugh or love or smile? What are the touchstones of our emotions? Until now, the people who asked such questions tended not to be the same people who ran software companies. Instead, they were writers, filmmakers, painters, musicians. They were in the traditional sense artists. We're about to change that tradition. The name of our company is Electronic Arts. So that's how EA started. Well, anyway, film gets very deep in story and presses against our emotions and we get attachments to characters and what happens as the film or television show progresses. We don't really do that much in games with emotion. In games, we push a button and we fire a weapon or we swing a sword, we run or we pick up supplies. We don't necessarily do things that are emotion driven. 
Uh, we want to be able to have natural language processing going and everything that will work with the use of biometric sensors to figure out what is the state of the human that is playing against this AI character that also has a virtual physicality and a virtual emotional state. I'm very interested in biometric sensors integrated with games where the AI characters have this virtual physicality and emotional state. There's a brand new laboratory that's been created in, in Stanford University Medical School called the Stanford Human Perception Laboratory. And they're looking at all these issues in a big way. In fact, they've created a new degree program entitled Computational Human Perception that is a direct descendant from the original design of the Computer Science Games Program at USC. Courses in that proposed master's in computational human perception include biosignal sensors and modalities, interactive experience design, human behavior models, human intelligent AI, building virtual worlds, advanced experience projects, two semester long projects, and startup pitches, productization, business models, and IP developments. This is thought of as a master's degree uh, that will help us make great steps in the field of computational human perception. So biosignals, sensors and modalities, the purpose of this course is to provide an understanding of the available biosignals generated by the human, an understanding of the sensors that can read those biosignals, and an understanding of the human modalities that can be computed from the biosignals as read by the sensors. Interactive experience design, the purpose of this course is to teach the principles of interactive design for interfacing and applying the various available technological devices, including AR, VR, XR headsets, mobile phones and tablets, and other wearables and portables. Design focus will be on interactive experience and game development for a serious and entertainment purpose. Human behavior models, the purpose of this course is to teach the principles of human behavior model design and the deployment of those models in an interactive experience. Particular foci will be on models of engagement, performance, emotion, fatigue, and comprehension, and the deployment of those models in interactive experiences. Human intelligent AI, the purpose of this course will be on the application of machine learning to create human intelligent AI imbued with human behavior models and streams from interpreted biosignals. Focus will be on perception, intent, and action, knowledge graphs for context and reasoning, as well as real-time applied machine learning attached to interactive experiences and games. Building virtual worlds, the purpose of this course is to have students rapidly build virtual and augmented reality experiences using existing tool sets and SDKs, the experiences to be built will be rapid prototypes of interactive experiences that either focus on R&D with respect to computational human perception or potential commercial products in or related to that domain. Advanced Experience Projects is a two semester long course that focuses on team based interactive experience development utilizing interpreted biosignals, human behavior models, human intelligent AI and applied machine learning. Projects proposed for this two semester course are approved in the spring semester by a committee of faculty, clinicians, designers, and venture advisors. And startup pitches, productization, business models, and IP development. The purpose, as purpose of this course is to teach the principles how to productize your startup idea, how to make a winning pitch for your idea, business models that make money for your developed prototype interactive experiences, and intellectual property development and protection trademarks, patents for those experiences, tool sets, and technologies. So this new degree program in the Associate Laboratory look a lot like what I'm thinking about with respect to a lab that can test out interesting future tech for the games as well as other industries. The most interesting thing is how Stanford has extended the game development model of the USC program into domains beyond games. And this is the picture that shows you sort of the research breadth and intellectual breadth of the things that Stanford Human Perception Laboratory is looking at from human century to human machine interface to human intelligent AI to applications. It's, it's quite broad and it's very cool. For this column, I think this whole area of biometric sensing or sensor-based gaming is super important for the future of games. But I remember taking the MSense sensor to the CTO of Electronic Arts and he said, oh, this is really neat. Why don't you come back when this sensor is shipped with all consoles that are shipped? I mean, this is basically a way of saying, well, yeah, we'd like it. We like the technology, but we don't want to jump into the pool until everybody else has already jumped in. 
The classic chicken egg, egg conundrum. He then continued, once that sensor is available everywhere, we can actually spend the money to build games that support and use the sensor. So no new tech until it makes total sense financially. No bravery or exploratory development on the horizon. We'll talk about this more in future columns. Now remember this column is high level. These are ideas. I believe there's a big possibility behind the utilization of biometric sensors in games and it will change everything we do in many fields if we have the will and the funding. Another topic I really like is the continued enhancement of the mobile game platform. In 2006, I received a donation from Motorola to create a mobile games course at USC. And at that time I was thinking, does anybody play anything other than Snake on phones? And is there really a business in mobile games? Well, we created that course and about 60 to 70% of my students have gone into positions in the mobile gaming industry. We have run that class with 100 students per semester, practically every semester since fall of 2006. Now what's happening is mobile devices are getting faster in terms of clock rate for CPU and graphics. And some mobile devices are now starting to have machine learning chips on board. Machine learning chips on board is an exciting development for anything requiring machine learning and natural language processing. With this package, mobile devices will soon be more capable than the game consoles that are out there. Consoles come out and they're out for five years and their hardware doesn't change. And at the third through fifth year of the console being released, it is slower and less capable than many mobile devices and PCs. So in the not too distant future, mobile devices will replace game consoles. We'll talk about that in the future column. The next game tech topic I want to talk about is 5G. Everyone has talked about 5G since 4G and about how 5G will magically make things better. I know we went from 3G to 4G LTE. People were very excited, except for those using Los Angeles International Airport, where there is barely cell phone service at all. And it's going to be worse because they're fighting against installing 5G at the Los Angeles Airport and all airports. Now, where I live in Los Angeles, I can see a 5G tower out the window in Skid Row. So I have really good signal here. And in Monterey, there's a really good 5G signal. With respect to games, the real question becomes, will the shape of games change as 5G is on all our mobile devices? I mean, that basically assumes that all the 4G LTE devices get thrown away and everyone buys the latest iPhone or the latest Pixel phone or whatever phone and says, we're going for 5G, we're diving into the deep end. We are also hoping that 5G will allow us to stream games to mobile devices nearly instantly and sufficiently fast enough that the failure of Google Stadia can be forgiven and forgotten and replaced with something better technically. Maybe some new technologies can be developed that can deliver games and slices of games nearly instantly. We're going to talk about these topics because I think everyone is absolutely going to want to know how this will change games. Another area that I absolutely love is machine learning for games. I, I teach a course entitled CSCI 527, Applied Machine Learning for Games at USC. What I know is that most of the machine learning for games work that is happening is happening by people at Google Research and in labs and universities. And most of the people who are using games or doing things with machine learning for games are sort of dabbling into games. They're not really people who know how to build games. They have better access to machine learning hardware than most of us. One of the things that I believe will change games in a large way with machine learning is that we can basically watch a master player play a game and grab screen images of what the player is doing. And we can put those into a machine learning system such that we can build an NPC who can approximate the gameplay ability of that master player. I think we're real close to that right now, but it's expensive computationally. As we get machine learning chips inside of our phones, inside of our consoles, inside of our PCs, then all kinds of things change. All of a sudden we have NPCs that are built by machine learning systems and they could play in similar fashion to the master players who are used to build the NPC eventually. So when we have machine learning chips and our mobile devices and a 5G network, we're going to have more engaging mobile games. With that 5G network, we'll be able to reach out to a warehouse full of NVIDIA machines, and we're going to do gameplay and interactions with characters like we've never done before. We're going to talk about that, what it, does it all mean, and how we learn how to author games like that. We're going to talk about where's the research institute that focuses on that. Another topic we're going to cover is the venture capitalists who funded the development of over 75 different AR and VR headsets, but there really was absolutely no funding for the development of interesting game content 
or user interface standards to make the development of such games easy and routine. The consequence of this was that everyone basically looked at the content that was out there and they played game one on their Oculus headset and game number one was interesting and you learned how to play it and you got it to game number two and it has a completely different user interface. Then you went to get to game number three and you know there's not a lot of things for you to choose from in this space because venture capitals didn't fund it and hardly anybody, there's little tiny studios focused on AR and VR development. Here's, the, here's my favorite picture. This is out of Nanjing. This gentleman's job is to provide a software interface so that you don't have to change your code too much to support all 75 of the headsets that he has, to, has determined to support. So the real question is, how do we recover such that we can have a thriving AR VR games marketplace in the future? So I think we're gonna have a topic on that. And if you have something to say about that, you might say, oh no, it's already happening. And there's lots of AR VR game development money I don't know, convince me otherwise. Maybe it's now called metaverse money, of course. Another topic we wanna to talk about is esports in the Olympics. Really, esports in the Olympics? Yay. Well, the Olympics are going to be here in Los Angeles in 2028, and we don't even have an esports center facility or resort in downtown Los Angeles anywhere. In Los Angeles downtown, we have lots of hotels. We have lots of uncompleted hotel buildings that could be turned into esports resorts, and we'd love to see that. And this is my idea of what an esports resort would look like. I'll just put it up there. It's going to have a hotel and spa and fitness center, maybe similar to Soho House. There will be hangout space, says coffee shops, smoothie shops, arcade, shop, arcade bars. There will be creative spaces where you can do game testing, game development, tech startups. Uh, there will be mansions for esports gamers. There will be artists in a box where there will be artists who are making art from downtown Los Angeles, where there are a whole host of DTLA artists and street artists who do amazing things. Uh, there will be a restaurant's dedicated space for the video game supper club. There'll be roving magicians, maybe Cirque Berserk. There will be an eSports arena and concert venue, something like Tubit Circus, a Dodgers museum, a game arcade, a Supercade museum, a uh, live YouTube stream it, music and gameplay radio booth visible in the lobby, and we'll have influencers there. We'll have Node, we'll have MC Lars, we'll have shopping with the hippest brands, we'll have restaurants. And I listed all my favorite restaurants here Peking Tavern, the Nickel Diner, Worst Kirka, uh, Clutch, Black Sheep Burgers, Horse Sleep Barbecue, Bar Ama, um, Cafe Gratitude. Oh, what else should be there? Um, Macaroni Republic, that's definitely ought to be on this list. Anyway, a big space next to the LA Live uh, Convention Center space so that we can have esports and a place to do esports in the Olympics. Because I think esports in the Olympics is going to be big. So we're going to talk about what would an esports resort look like because we want to build one. We want to build one in time for the Olympics in 2028. And it's going to be kind of like a theme park in a building, like a Vegas casino, but it's going to focus on games and health and swimming and all kinds of eating and all this really cool stuff we will discuss. Uh, patent litigation and NPE is that one topic that I believe hits all game companies and is important for all of us in games is patent litigation. I've experienced working on 40 to 42 different cases of patent litigation against big game companies, and I've been an expert witness for some 46 game and computing companies. So I want to talk a little bit about my experience as an expert witness and what it all means, and maybe even talk about some of my ideas on patent litigation. Of course, I can't talk about any of my cases I'm working on now, but I'll try and reach back and extract some of the things that I've learned over the years, especially how to write really good patents. But with respect to what does patent litigation mean for the game industry, we need to talk about that and figure out what better thing we could do. Maybe we need to build a research center that basically collects massive data on early games such that they can be used as prior art references to basically stop non-practicing entities from going after people who are productively building games. Okay, so that's what I'm thinking about doing over the next couple of columns here at IEEE Computer. And if you have comments about those areas or topics, or you want to rant back to me on what, on why what I say is nonsense, I want to hear. What I'm going to do every time we finish one of these columns and goes to print, 
I'm going to do is put it up online and maybe point to it from my Facebook, uh, my LinkedIn, so that I can receive comments from you. And maybe you can react to some of those comments in future columns online to enlighten you in real time. This is the games column. You have a wonderful day. The Facebook group is listed here in this link. I'll leave it up just for a couple of seconds because you can always pause the video while you're watching it. Anyway, you guys have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful evening and great day.